Well, good afternoon, everyone. As we're coming to our last session of the of the day here, we're going to do a lightning session with the analysts and get their perspectives. Lightning session. <laughs> well, I'll have to have a, a, a little bit of play on words. And if, if nothing else, at the end of the session, if uh, we, we don't have questions for the audience for the analysts, which will be unusual, we could always uh, debate with uh, Stephen Bates a little bit on uh, solving his night seas issues, you know, light speed limitations by looking at practical, practical applications of quantum entanglement or some other topic like that. <laughs> a tall one, or two, right? So uh, for today, our, uh, our analysts, uh, we have um, with us uh, Jim Handy from uh, Objective Analysis and Tom Coughlin from Coughlin Associates, always a, uh, a entertaining duo. Cheech and Chong. Cheech and Chong. <laughs> you, you speak clicking clack now. <laughs> Also with us, uh, our dear friend, uh, our, our dear mile high friend, uh, Randy Kearns uh, from uh, Evaluator Group. We say that uh, with SNEA having its headquarters in uh, Colorado, in, uh, in, in the fun state. And uh, we will also have with us a dynamic duo of uh, Gil Russell and Alan, Alan Nebel from uh, WebFeed Research. So without further ado, I will turn it out turn it over to Jim and Tom. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about market kind of stuff, and I've got a hardware background, and so all of this software that's been going on today is stuff that you know I don't really account for very much. I just talk about chips and how they're going to get in there. So, uh, you know, and, and I'm gonna try to kind of rip through this, because I've got a lot of slides for my five minutes, and then Tom's got five minutes. But there, there are actually two ways that NVDIMs are, or persistent memory is, is um, falling into the market right now. First is by NVDIM-N. And the NVDIM-N is made out of DRAM plus NAND flash plus a controller plus a supercapacitor, and so necessarily it's more expensive than just standard DRAM DIMs. And that limits the applications that it can go into, into ones where they're willing to pay for this added functionality. And that ends up being high availability systems, financial databases, and some hyperscale applications. This chart here is a forecast. It's out of a report that I've got a flyer for out on the SNEA booth out there. Well, what used to be the SNEA booth. Um, and I, I, I've got more flyers for it in my briefcase. But, but basically, uh, we did a report back in November um, that tried to project where these markets were going to go. Um, the, the other way that uh, NVDIMs are going to get into the market is um, the NVDIMP, which is made using one of these alternative technologies like the ones that you heard about this afternoon. And where they're going to really succeed is if they get to be cheaper than DRAM in price, and in which case everybody will want it. This chart here actually is from another report of ours that's on 3D Crosspoint that, um, that it, the, the thing that that really shows is how DRAM and NAND flash pricing um, compare to each other. And so today, DRAM prices are about 20 times as high as NAND flash prices. Um, and the reason why SSDs are so extremely popular is not just because of their speed, but because of their speed and their price. That they, you can actually reduce the amount of DRAM in a system if you use an SSD. And if anybody has any questions about that, I can talk about it in the future. But <clears throat> for these applications, persistence is secondary. They're looking at it from a cost performance standpoint. And that's what we're expecting to see drive the popularity of persistent memory in the future. It all comes down to this, which a lot of you guys have seen before because I seem to present it just about every time I turn around. And this is something that shows how the memory storage hierarchy works. Across the bottom, you've got price per gigabyte in orders of magnitude. In the vertical axis, you've got the bandwidth, megabytes per second. And um, you've got the different stages of the memory storage hierarchy. So it starts with the L1 cache closest to the processor, goes down through the other caches to DRAM. Persistent memory plugs a gap between the NAND flash SSD and the DRAM. And then you've got hard drive and tape. Um, anything that doesn't fit into that hierarchy then runs into problems. Is it too slow for its cost or is it too expensive for its speed? And so the NVDIM ends that are being made today that are more expensive than DRAM actually have a higher price per gigabyte than DRAM. So they'd end up, let me see if I can get the laser pointer, they'd end up sitting 
about here. And so then the question is, you know, they don't fit in, why not buy more DRAM instead? Well, certain people can't, can't stand that. They need to have the persistence. So, but, but in general, when persistent memory fits into the memory storage hierarchy, it will become universally used. Um, we learned how prices work for memory chips very well with NAND flash. And this is something that wasn't really clear until I really looked at the uh, numbers uh, only about six months ago. Um, NAND flash uh, for the same die area as DRAM, SLC NAND, which is a more expensive version, it, and, and if it was made on the same process, it ended up having twice as dense of a chip. And so what that implies is that NAND flash's price should always have been half as much as DRAM's. But the trouble was that NAND flash was not made in the same kind of volume as DRAM. It was always made in smaller volume, and so the economies of scale prevented NAND flash prices from crossing over DRAM's until 2004. Well, what happened in 2004 that made that happen was the NAND flash wafer volume, the number of wafers of NAND flash that got made, reached about a third, that of DRAM. And then you got this crossover that I like to show people. This is once again a uh, logarithmic price axis, and it's price per gigabyte of <coughs> NAND flash and of DRAM. It's based, this is WSTS numbers. And WSTS didn't have numbers before 2004 for the NAND flash market because it was too small of a market. So I've kind of projected those backwards. Um, former employers of mine had those numbers, and I kind of remember what they looked like, but I don't have, have the other company's numbers. And, you know, Alan actually has numbers back that far, WebFeet Research. So he could, he could probably actually show that to you. Um, but, but, oh, sorry. So anyway, we had this crossover in 2004, and you can see that NAND and DRAM prices have been separating ever since then. And that's where you get in that little chart that I showed you before, the 20 to 1 ratio between the prices. But we learned something from 3D NAND flash also about difficulties. 3D <coughs> NAND requires a ton of new processes that have never been used in semiconductors before. So even though 3D NAND uses pure silicon, a pure silicon process, it's a process that's really unusual. And so because of that, 3D NAND is actually three <coughs> years late in its introduction from where it should be. So that's hard enough by itself, but then what happens when you add a new material, when you add the magnetic material, the phase change material, resistive RAM material, the nanotubes, you know, that, that ends up making things very difficult. And so it drives a lot of cost into the manufacturing for revolutionary change. So, you know, you've got this economies of scale, you've got the difficulties of new processes. What is it going to take to be able to get in there? And we're going to have to have volumes of any of these new memories that approach the volumes of DRAM, just like the way that NAND flash crossed over the price when it got to DRAM things. Um, we also need software support for persistence if, we, if people want to use persistence. And SNEA is all over that, like a duck on a June bug, they used to say in the southeast. I'm a Georgia Tech grad. <laughs> uh, so, like a duck on a June bug. Um, <laughs> but, other applications will use it more for cost performance, and that's where we're expecting to see the really big applications for this. So persistence is going to take a while to slide into the mainstream, but if you can get better cost performance by using persistent memory as an added layer because it's cheaper and gives better cost performance, that's where we'll really fit in. Tom's going to give you a rundown of a bunch of uh, technologies. So I shall. Yeah, how'd I do time-wise? Uh. <laughs> but we'll make it up. Uh, so how many people here are actually working on non-flash uh, persistent memory? I know there's a bunch of you here. Yeah. Okay. So this is for you. So um, let's, let's go review some of the major uh, technologies that are out there now. So first of all, the phase change memory, 3D cross points, example that in that Optane product from Intel. Uh, you can actually look at Amazon. I did last week. Uh, it's about $31 for 480 gigabytes, so about $1.32 per gigabyte to buy from Amazon. They're, uh, they're talking about launching Optane DIMMs in the second quarter of 2018. Um, Micron hasn't announced a ship date for its Quant X technology, but I believe they're looking at also a DIMM based products, so memory based products. And uh, new Micron Intel Fab, uh, the current agreement is focusing more on the 3D cross point rather than 3D, 3D, 3D flash, which is an announcement last week and a half. 
um, magnetic random access memory. Um, Everspin's received revenue now, uh, just recently announced, for their 256 gigabit chip. Um, SDT RAM products in Q4, and their production ramp uh, is uh, starting now. Um, samples 28 nanometer, one gigabit chips uh, from Everspin have been promised. Uh, there's been samples, but uh, it's not clear when the products are going to be out there. Uh, the first one to two gigabit, gig, gigabyte uh, MRAM PCIe SSDs are out there. In fact, I think they're actually out there, literally. Um, Global Foundries is shipping MRAM for embedded applications, and Spin Transfer, who I know is here, uh, has samples, uh, samples of 80 nanometer OST MRAM chips, and uh, is also starting this year, many uh, promised introductions of MRAM uh, for instance, by uh, uh, TSMC, Samsung, uh, Tokyo Electron, and others. Um, another one, I know there's a guy out here, actually I said I'd call him out, I talked to him earlier this week, uh, uh, from, a, from Germany, he's working on uh, ferroelectric uh, RAM. And there's been some new life in ferroelectric RAM. There's actually been devices out there for decades for specialized applications, especially <coughs> for radiation-hardened uh, applications. So it's a long, list, long history of niche products, caching and buffers, but difficult to scale. Um, uh, work actually introducing hafnium oxide into uh, general CMOS processes. They also found that if you used a crystalline, the right crystalline form of hafnium oxide, you can have a significant ferroelectric properties and it's put new life into the whole idea of ferroelectric RAM, which is a fairly low power, uh, fairly fast device. So possible NAND-like devices uh, uh, are possible with this. Uh, resistive RAM that sort of rolls up a whole bunch of technologies. That should be the nanotube guys, it'd be the ionic guys, be the precipitation, all the other ways in which people are making um, uh, resistive products. Uh, there, are, there are some products out there now, for instance, from Fujitsu and Panasonic, crossbar sampling 40 nanometer resistive RAM made by China's SMIC. Uh, TSMC and UMC put resistive RAM on their roadmaps, um, and it's uh, still touted for storage class memories, various types are. Um, and for applications like HP uh, talked about using, the, uh, using this kind of technology, although solutions are still elusive. One interesting application is actually sort of doing a computing application using resistive devices. There's a lot of literature out there on neuromorphic computing by using the properties of resistive RAM devices. So some interesting things there. Um, here's a general technology uh, comparison. Uh, the resistive RAM is a little more generic because it's, it's covering a lot of different technologies. I think everyone's going to get copies of these, so I'm not going to go over everything just to save some time. But uh, just uh, uh, looking at uh, the variations in endurance, and write time, read time, the power consumption, the size of the cell, um, and then uh, some estimates, at least, of the cost in terms of dollars per, per gigabit. So um, Jim and I uh, are going to be doing a report. We're going to be looking at uh, these emerging or emerged memory uh, technologies uh, covering all the major solid state storage technologies and companies. Um, describe uh, the, what's driving applications and some of the formats and some of the other technical interfaces and other things that are going to be helping to drive this memory centric computing, et cetera. And try to do projections in for volatile and persistent memory for both embedded and discrete devices. Uh, perhaps some also projections for capital investments with the target of May 2018. So in summary, uh, persistent memory needs to meet the storage memory hierarchy, whatever that is. Okay? Um, it won't be used for its persistence necessarily. There are many, it won't all be used for its persistence. There's other reasons why people would use this, like speed. Um, there are many types of persistent memory, and these technologies will probably fit, at least initially, into different market niches. And with such a, a zoo of different types of technologies out there, it'll probably be a while before everything settles down and we know what the future is going to be if it ever settles down. So with that, thank you very much. Did I make my time? <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks. I'm here, and I'm going to talk a little bit about so persistent memory as storage, but I'm going to do it from the IT client perspective. I spend a majority of my time working with Fortune 1000 companies on their strategies for storing and managing information with a five-year horizon. I, I just got finished with one, so a lot of this is very current in my mind. So uh, it's really interesting to think about here. Um, some of the... Uh, ideas and everything you hear, it's just incredible. A lot of brilliant people working on a lot of things. But sometimes you need to be pulled back to reality and say, 
what's really going to happen with the majority of customers and where are they at? And I find, uh, back to the uh, Colorado analogy, I find a lot of companies are ahead of their skis, out over their skis a little bit too much sometimes. Um, certainly, this transition away from electromechanical devices is continuing most companies. And most of that's being uh, phased in based on the amortization of the devices they currently have. And that's the key point. Most companies work off financial models and understanding their financial models and when things change is very important. Um, the transformations are big. Performance, I think we all get that. The other one that uh, not many of you have spoken about but is really big for companies is longevity. How long can I keep the information what do I have to do? And I think it was in one of the first presentations, they really talked about the magnitude of the problem of using persistent memory as storage and the fact that it's so dramatic and there's so much. If there are issues about having to move that continually, it becomes problematic for a lot of these enterprises. The longevity has significant value. Unfortunately, most don't quantify that value very well. Biggest issue, and this is number one, is how do you give them a value representation that's meaningful? And these are typically done as economics for companies. A lot of people I deal with are you know, the VP of IT, sometimes the CIOs, and certainly the, the directors of IT. Everything they do has to have some economic basis. And unfortunately, when you talk to them and you say, hey, we can do things in 10 nanoseconds in some of these presentations, that doesn't translate to economics to them directly. I've done a number of economic models for a lot of them, say what that means from a standpoint of this particular application, it can do so many more transactions per second, and then for that company, an uh, increase in 1,000 transactions per second has a direct dollar value. But Here's the real problem. The majority of vendor salesmen, the salesmen currently out there today that call on these enterprises, they are stuck on talking about dollar per gigabyte. They say that to the customer. The customer is stuck on it as well. Does that represent the value you get from these wonderful technologies? It does not. That's a data at rest measure not the value of what they're getting from these technologies. However, unless you can communicate to those customers what that value is in a better way, that salesman's still gonna be out there saying dollar per gigabyte. And it's, it's really interesting. When, when I go out and talk to them and they say dollar per gigabyte, it says, so you're concerned about dollar per gigabyte? And I say, okay, you should just buy tape. I stopped talking. And the reason I stopped talking, because that's absurd, right, for what they're talking about running their big applications. But I stopped talking to try and get them to think that's what they're saying, is they're only concerned about that data at rest the cheapest possible, and that's the cheapest possible. So why bother talking anymore? And I try to get them to think about the value of this technology. The, solid state memory technologies, persistent memory going into storage. Uh, this is really a problem for companies, vendor companies, to be able to quantify that value easily, communicate it to a sales guy who's interested in how long does it take for that, his transaction to close, and then for the customer to be able to express it internally as a justification for making an investment in purchasing that technology. I spend a lot of my time helping those customers make that justifications to CFOs and CIOs, primarily because this, the vendor salesmen don't do a good job. This is the other thing. You hear from another uh, a number of companies, and they talk about how well they've done with this technology. Maybe they're in a very unique vertical, or maybe they're companies that are have separate organizations within their companies that want to exploit new technologies. The problem is the majority is in this adoption curve that's in the middle of the bell curve. So if you're looking and getting excited about technology, you've got a few key customers, that may not be where the big revenue is, and you have to plan for how you attract 
the biggest amount of customers. That takes time. And, and for startup companies, you may be out of, out of money by then. For large companies, hopefully you've got the benefit of, of organization that will stay uh, in it for the long term until it matures, until there's a bigger audience out there. Okay, so that's it for my part. Daniel Hoseo, I used to work for Samsung. <laughs> well, gross quote, I worked for uh, those guys too. Um, what we've got today is, it's a pretty interesting dynamic that we have on the stage here, but we took a look around and, uh, and we took a clean sweep look at the market and what was going on. And we said, well, if I was a complete idiot, or I was a cab driver, let's say, not that the cab driver's an idiot, and he was going to chat me up for nine minutes, what would he say on persistent memory? And uh, he'd probably come to a really logical conclusion. If any of you have read The Black Swan, you'll understand what I'm getting at here. We all have uh, a fiction by which we live things, and uh, a lot of people have fictions about uh, memory, some of them good, most of them bad for a lot of reasons. What uh, we're really looking at is, is that uh, we go back and look at storage class memory, and the original swamp drain was for hard disk drives. It wasn't for what we're talking about here. Um, in fact, the rapid growth of NAND flash, and we got into IOP mania, and everybody had so much data that they didn't know what to do with it, Ball. So uh, we had b got big data out of that. And uh, then came in-memory compute and cognitive analytics. And people started to really understand that we had to get serious about memory because this takes a lot of memory. And if we start uh, adding uh, cognitive analytics slash neural networks, it takes even more to train them. And it has to be really fast, and it has to be <coughs> unsegmented. It, it, no P, uh, we can't have a PCI interface. It just isn't going to work. So we added a byte addressability to SCM, and presto, we got persistent memory. So now we're going to call it NVRAM as a DRAM replacement. Now I'll repeat that. Non-volatile RAM as a DRAM replacement. And all you systems guys and all you server people riding the train to immortality, well, guess what? We're going to say something else here that uh, may come as a small surprise a little bit later. So what is uh, NVRAM from this definition? Of course, this is hypothetical, but it's DDR4 pin level function period, you put it in, it works like a DDR4. We'd like a cache latency of 13 and a half, but probably 20 is where it's going to end up. We've got an interesting thing between persistence and endurance. They're an inverse relationship. So do we have to last 10 years? So if I can relax that 10 year down to a 10 year, all of a sudden my endurance goes up way beyond the use period of the device, the useful life of that period. That's another thing that needs to be uh, really looked at and discussed. Also, it leads to higher density roadmaps. And the higher density roadmaps is one of those, um, some people call it intangible, but in reality, it's very tangible. It's very cost ridden. It makes a company design with the in mind that they will not have to go through massive changes in design in the future. And zero refresh, 7%. And power reduction. Oh, power reduction is really rather amazing. Um, 
we've had a good run with DRAM. It's 52 years. Name me a device in tech that's gotten 52 years as a technology. A, a none. This is the hands down winner. Gains, uh, it's limited by its, uh, the memory size and its cost. We're, we're going one way. This is, a, this is a single layer device. You, you can't stack it. That's a real problem as it works out. And VRAM fulfills a whole lot of uh, improvements along on that long-term roadmap. And that's uh, the lateral shrink density. You get the XY square, inverse square. Uh, multiple uh, layer introductions. You can layer this stuff. So we can go 816 of in, in the introduction. There's a substantial power reduction because it's got zero power on because it's, uh, guess what? Persistent memory. And most importantly, it opens the market for the MLC, the TLC, and QLC type devices. And those might even be on the same device. It's speed grade uh, dependent. Um, we've looked at the product positioning on this product. It's, uh, of course, on the system level context. What are you going to use this device in? Is, will it be price competitive with Crosspoint in a $71 billion market? Uh, what are the competitive uh, performance comparisons in it? And, of course, the secondary supply suggests an open standard. We think an open standard is very important in order to make a near or close to commodity market. Otherwise, it won't be commodity, and it will not be as low cost. Uh, 3D Crosspoint, in our views, will dominate the market beginning in the second half of 18. This thing has been primed and ready to go, and it's designed in. We also um, are uh, forecasting that uh, the NVM, NVRAM products will be introduced uh, beginning ramp in the second half of 2019. We also see that NVRAM replacing DRAM and NAND in the mobile space in 2020. And this is extremely important because um, we see that uh, the mobile space is the introductory point of uh, entry for billions of people. I said billions of people in the world. And we don't see that uh, that will not back down any in the foregoing future. We see it enabling a very large persistent memory arrays, and, and we really mean big <coughs> arrays. Um, that uh, artificial intelligent algorithms uh, to reduce compute times will drive the market and using these from hours to minutes. <coughs> and we saw some of that earlier in our discussion about uh, Disney and uh, using an AI algorithm to reduce from 36 hours to nine minutes. Um, the processor in memory, or what we call the bottleneck be gone, is the uh, beginning of data execution in memory. And we've already had uh, some people actually seriously doing work in this area and with some pretty amazing results. The uh, data motion, data in motion is what we call it, um, is going from inches to microns. It means you'll be executing in memory, you won't move the data as much. And that's a, an incredible power savings. And we're, that's going from terabytes into the petabytes because you're talking about ex parallel execution in the memory amongst uh, possibly petabytes of data. It's really, uh, you know, this is something that boggles the mind. It takes a while to get a channel on it. And, and lastly up, we're looking at before, we actually have some numbers, heteroassociative memory. Now what the heck is a heteroassociative memory, all right? Yeah, I had to look it up, but uh, uh, it's how the human brain works. And basically what we know about the human brain, nobody knows really how it works yet, but we're getting better at it. Um, and there's gonna be a lot of, uh, the other thing is, what falls out of this will fall into improving standard von Neumann computing. We firmly believe that. We're already seeing that happen right now, as a matter of fact. And um, the, uh, you can take a few bits of sensory information and feed it into the human brain. And the human brain will fill in all the other experiential parts. 
and it's not the way we've looked at memory as an address of an XY. It's just a place to go get something. But now we're looking at memory as the thing that will find the like in kind items. And this is a completely different way of looking because it's saying that memory is being used to discover other things in memory. And with that, I will uh, not give it over to Alan because we don't have that slide. Newt, we got the wrong. Uh, yeah, that's the wrong. And this one was supposed to be that way. Oh well. Um, we have some numbers on this, and it happens to be with uh, um, looking at. Uh, let me see this for a second. Uh, yeah, why don't you take this for? Uh, this is a. Oh God, you put Apple on there. Yeah, I did. Oh, okay. Um, Hypothetical. Um, okay. Um, trying to do a forecast on um, a fiction that doesn't exist yet and looking at um, how we're seeing um, where we can um, envision first uh, 3D cross point um, and We've seen the delays of how that's um, been always uh, held back from getting here as we've been hoping for in quite a while. And so I put together a... Uh, Go this way and I'll load okay. it for you. All right. I put together, a, looking at um, not only a, a little bit of cro uh, 3D cross point, but um, trying to look at what the impacts it would be of the NV RAM uh, device that we're uh, fairly sure it's, it's going to be uh, available through the <coughs> second half of 2019 and on in, uh, throughout the rest of the forecast period. And I've looked at uh, how to um, quantify it uh, first in uh, in a conservative forecast, looking at the, in the mobile uh, sector and, and looking at just the smartphones and um, trying to see how much of uh, the DRAM and of the NAND could be replaced with um, this single uh, device. And I've, here we go. And, uh, there, right? there we go. Okay, what I've done is um, looked at uh, just seeing where we're looking at the uh, Apple um, smartphone uh, units being sold, and then I've decided to uh, put an attach rate because of the, the value proposition of, of being able to replace uh, both the DRAM and the NAND with uh, NVRAM. And looking at uh, what the, uh, the size of the smartphone DRAM market is in, in revenue, and the same for the NAND, and then just doing the math to um, <coughs> look at um, uh, what the, the iPhone component is of the DRAM market here and the NAND market um, as well. And then um, looking at what the savings would be in terms of overall NVRAM uh, over the next uh, 19 through 22. And then um, this is a fairly significant number, and that's just the beginning. The other model I was looking at was taking the NVDIM market uh, dash P and the cross point type of uh, market and quantifying what that would look like as well as uh, uh, showing just here on the uh, 3D uh, crosspoint uh, revenues here. And this is just a, a fairly conservative way of uh, transferring um, basically the forecast for 3D crosspoint into uh, the associated with uh, the NVRAM market. I've used the same pricing for uh, NVRAM that 
I have projected for uh, 3D crosspoint as being um, <coughs> about 30% uh, of the price of, the, of DRAM and, uh, and ratcheting it down uh, appropriately um, over the time period. And so this gives us an overall market of uh, just looking at the ND RAM of um, $3.1 billion in 2021. And this, I do believe, is a very uh, basic forecast. Uh, there's a lot more uh, markets that could be derived from this as well. Uh, and it's also, I think it's a bit understated uh, quite a bit. Uh, so, this is just one attempt of uh, putting some numbers to uh, our vision of where we see that um, persistent memory is coming into its own and uh, it will lend itself to uh, in-memory computing and uh, in the long term to cognitive computing uh, as we go out in time. So, that's what I Great, thank you very much. <laughs>